Kia ora koutou katoa and welcome to the first webinar for Richmond on the Rise. Um, the format for the webinar today, we're going to do a brief introduction and then we'll have a presentation on Richmond on the Rise. And while we're doing that presentation, you can ask any questions that you want to ask using the question and answer um, feature on at the bottom of Zoom. And we'll get to those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so the main thing about this is that if you do want to provide feedback on Richmond on the Rise, the primary place to do that is on the Shape Tasman website. So if you go to Shape Tasman, then you will find um, Richmond on the Rise. All the information you need to know is there and the feedback is there as well. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Jeremy Butler, who's going to be guiding us through this and starting the presentation. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, yeah, uh, kia ora, everybody. Um, I'll just start that presentation now by sharing my screen. Down there and down there. Okay, just checking uh, that we can see that presentation. Not yet, we can't, no. Oh. Now we can. We can now, great. Thanks for that. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, good afternoon, now everybody. Um, so yeah, just want to uh, welcome everybody along. Um, as Andrew mentioned, this is a uh, um, an introductory webinar to the Richmond on the Rise project. Um, as Andrew mentioned, this is a, a summary of the information that we've got. It's a really it's a big project, uh, and so there's a lot more information on the Shape Tasman website. <clears throat> and um, of course, you're welcome to come along, and we'd really encourage you to come along to our open days, which is next Tuesday and Wednesday in Richmond, um, just over the road from Sundial Square. My name is Jeremy Butler. I am the, uh, in my day job, I'm the team leader of the urban and rural policy team here at Council, and I'm leading this project on behalf of Tasman District Council. Uh, Richmond on the Rise as a project is basically kind of an easy way to remember the the name for um, what's called the Richmond Spatial Intensification Plan, uh, which is a um, a plan that's looking at ways that we can grow Richmond to accommodate more residents um, and also and provide a range of housing options, um, but also making sure that that housing growth is in the right places. Um, and there's a number of elements too, such as uh, how we um, how we work with our parks and our commercial areas, how we can create a greater sense of vibrancy and identity to Richmond. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll uh, just introduce uh, the rest of the team. Um, the we've um, utilised, uh, we've engaged uh, Boffermiskel, which is a, a consultancy, uh, a national consultancy. Um, Miriam is our urban designer, Miriam Moore, uh, working with Boffermiskel, who's done a lot of the design work. And uh, Stephanie Stiles is a planner with Boffermiskel and has uh, has. I guess uh, coordinated the project from Boffmer School and is um, undertaking is providing us with planning advice. There's also a, a large range of other count, other inputs from uh, specialist economists, council staff, and uh, um, stakeholders, uh, particularly within uh, Richmond, who have been involved in uh, testing uh, some of the, the methods and the options uh, for, from this project. Okay, we'll just, oops, excuse me. Um, right, a little bit more about the project. Uh, it's it's a project to guide growth. So we've had other projects in the past for Richmond, but this is a, a the next step really. It's the, a guide that will take us into the future. It's a spatial strategy for the future layout of Richmond, uh, and with a particular focus on intensification. How we can provide a, a wider variety of houses uh, and in locations that are appropriate, uh, so that people can walk and cycle to um, shops and services and where they work. Uh, it, it, I guess the, the added aspect here, which is identified on the slide, is also um, to try and reduce sprawl into the surrounding rural area. <clears throat> We've heard very consistently um, that people don't want to see that sprawl onto productive land, uh, and, and they prefer us to, to grow up rather than out. So this is a, a, an effort to try and do that, to, to really look at how we can grow up in a, a coordinated way. Uh, how does this project fit in with um, Council's work more generally? Uh, we, uh, many of you will remember that we developed a, uh, in conjunction with Nelson City Council, we developed a future development strategy uh, up here that, that was adopted by both Nelson and Tasman Councils in 2022, last year. Uh, and that was a high, high, higher level uh, project looking at how growth, uh, where growth could be accommodated over the whole of Nelson and Tasman. A big part of the 
response or the outcome of that future development strategy was that growth should uh, be uh, in within the existing Richmond footprint uh, provided for by that intensification. So what we're doing now really is is taking that future development strategy and implementing it. We're looking at a structure plan, uh, which is um, it was two structure plans, and we looked at Richmond South. This was part of uh, the project, which was called Reimagining Richmond South, that has um, uh, sort of been parked at the moment in order to focus on the existing footprint of Richmond, which is our Richmond Spatial Intensification Plan, or in other words, Richmond on the Rise. So this is really what we're working on today. Now, how will that be implemented? Once we've landed this Richmond on the Rise project, that will flow through into a plan change uh, where we can look at new zones and rules, policies, which will actually give effect to the plan on the ground. Uh, there's also, under the new legislation, which some may be aware of, we need to develop a new plan with Nelson. So we will be building the, the outcomes of this project into that new plan as well. It won't be called the Tasman Environment Plan anymore because it needs to be joint with Nelson, but it'll be an equivalent plan under the new legislation. And then there'll be the long-term plan. Now that's a, a different process. That's more about where council invests its money. So how does council, uh, what what councils, what, sorry, what projects does council prioritise in order to give effect to, to this Richmond on the Rise plan? So I'll just hand over to uh, to Steph now, who's going to uh, talk through some of the drivers behind the project. Steph. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, as as Jeremy says, you know the focus of this project is on housing and accommodation growth of people, driven by both the current and projected population growth rates, which were worked out through that future development project. So Richmond's residential growth has been increasing rapidly for a number of years, and it's projected to keep increasing. It's seen as the, the key place for growth for Nelson and Tasman districts. And the future development strategy looked at that higher level of what kind of numbers are we looking at, and generally where do they need to be accommodated, and all of that background information is available through the Shape Tasman and Council websites if you want to go back into those details. As Jeremy says, this project is now about taking that to a more specific level, dropping it down into Richmond and saying, we know how many people we need to fit in, where do we put them and what does that look like? And as you'll see from the graphs and, and numbers on the screen in front of you, we're looking at a population increase that's roughly in the order of around 2,000 more houses over the next 10 years, which is a fairly high rate of growth. In terms of the risks that we're facing of not growing, we're, we're really trying to look at doing this right. So it's not just about letting the market lead and sitting back and waiting to see what happens. We, we really want to make sure that things like new houses provide housing choice. So not just three and four bedroom houses all the time, but other things like flats and apartments that provide for single people and couples. Over time, an increase in total numbers of housing and a better range of housing is one of the keys that helps to tackle housing affordability. And if necessary, once we've dealt with the growth that can we, we can fit into Richmond well, there might be the opportunity to look at growth outwards around the edges, but that's not going to be ideal if we want to protect the productive land. We're also very conscious that we don't want growth and development to be in the wrong places, areas that are going to be at risk from things like flooding or sea level rise, or areas that can't be efficiently serviced with new infrastructure. And at the end of the day, the bottom line is, if we don't do this well, Richmond will become a less attractive place to live in the future. As well as looking at the housing, which of course is the focus of this, it's also looking at integration of all the components that make a good town and make a great town out of Richmond. So we're looking at things like businesses, recreation, connections, and there'll be many opportunities to grow Richmond in really good, exciting ways. We're hoping that this project will help facilitate some of those. It's also important to point out that this project doesn't sit alone. It builds on past projects. Over many years, there have been various different growth plans. And one of the ones that people may 
recognise is the town centre plan, which led to the upgrade of Queen Street and some of those projects. So this is another one in a series of, of planning opportunities, and there'll be more in the future. What we're trying to do with this is really focus on bringing all the different components together to create a really great town. I'll hand you back to Jeremy to talk about the project area and objectives. Right, thanks, Steph. Uh, so what we've got on the slide here now that you can see is the the boundaries of the project. And this is essentially the, the existing urban boundary of Richmond as it currently stands. Uh, from Champion Road here, uh, which, which is our boundary with Nelson City, uh, around a, a coastal margin, and then down um, uh, right through even to Swamp Road, uh, where we have some uh, future industrial land uh, here. Um, it takes in Nelson Pine Industries, uh, and then our Berry, the Berryfields growth area, which is largely developed as a residential area and continues to develop. Uh, and then um, around with the land just down to the south of Hart Road and Bait Up Road, uh, which abuts onto the, the area which was identified as part of the Reimagining Richmond South project, <clears throat> which is currently paused. Uh, and then on the sort of southeast side here, um, the hills. So we have challenges all around, as we've, we've identified. We have uh, sea level rise um, on our, along our coastal margin. We have productive land to our southwest, and we have um, hills which aren't of wonderful stability uh, on our southeast. And then, of course, the boundary with Nelson City um, to our northeast. So, um, so this that, that that footprint there, that's really the the boundary for the or the, the area for the study and the project, uh, and it takes into account both our town centre and all those residential areas that I mentioned, as well as commercial uh, areas. Um, the project is really in two parts, and we'll come on to this in just a second, um, but looking at uh, the the town centre as a focal point for some of these outcomes that, that Stephanie's been mentioning, and then the wider area, what does the, the rest of Richmond as a whole need to take it into the future? Uh, the next one. So the first thing we're doing a project like this is to identify a set of objectives, and that's really important because it guides, uh, it, it provides a tool where we can test our interventions. What are we going to do, and does it achieve the objectives that we've set? So that's the first step, we've, and we identified a number of objectives. Now these are just the headings, but there's two or three or four objectives that sit under each of these headings, and which can be found in the more detailed documentation on Shape Tasman. So the first one is Mana Whenua. We uh, we work with our iwi partners and we uh, we we discuss what are their uh, objectives and things they want to see come out of um, our urban places and in this case Richmond uh, housing. We've mentioned that several times around the 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 objective of providing a greater variety of housing types and in the right locations and greater density. Uh, centres and community heart. How can we uh, support the centres that we have and and really support them to go forward and become stronger and provide that community heart, places that people really want to be and spend time and that, that sort of vibrancy. And they want to be, for example, at night time or, um, or, or spend sort of quality time and come to. Identity, uh, Richmond's getting to be a really big place. It's, it's quite uh, spread out and there's a range of different uh, neighbourhoods. How can we give each that do we indeed want to and identify neighbor, different neighbourhoods, and then how can we provide those different neighbourhoods with greater identity? Movement, getting around Richmond is, is an important aspect. Also getting to the other towns and through to Nelson where people might work, uh, and what are the ways we can uh, really achieve that? And then our green and blue infrastructure is always important, of course. Our reserves, uh, the greening of our, of our towns and, and, and cities, is, is an important topic at the moment, and our blue infrastructure, our waterways, our uh, and which provide double the stormwater corridors. So we need to be thinking about those too, and our hazard preparedness. We do have a number of hazards, and uh, sea level rise is one, and uh, flooding and the intense, intensity of rain that we expect through climate change is another. So we need to be thinking about all of those as part of this plan and provide for appropriate outcomes. Now I think uh, Miriam will. Um, I'll just hand over to Miriam, who will take us through some of the more detailed work uh, and constraints and opportunities. Thanks, Miriam. Cool. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, so the first step to um, moving forward and in, in shaping the plan was to look at the constraints and opportunities um, in the existing urban footprint. Um, so what you see here on the map, this information was gathered um, 
variety of methods. Uh, we use GIS data to get sort of um, those geophysical qualities like land contours, um, sea level rise potential, and then also those planning qualities, such as basic things like what your average lot size is and just the street layout. Um, and we combined this with a lot of background research of what's been done to date, um, including existing plans, so not rehashing everything that's been done, such as walking and cycling plan, but including those and integrating um, those opportunities that have already been established. Um, we did some on the ground site visits just to get the layout of the land. And um, once we gathered this, um, also sought anecdotal evidence from stakeholder groups, uh, locals and um, uh, council experts as well across all um, the relevant fields. Um, and so all of these were mapped as you can see, which is quite high level, but on the next slide, I will outline what the, um, some of the key constraints and opportunities that we found. So um, some of the constraints included the sewage and stormwater capacity limitations, of course, the existing built form and how we can work with what's already there, um, land fragmentation, um, lots of subdivided land exists and uh, very little land, large land holdings, um, the existing residents expectations of how they see Richmond and, and how they want it to grow, um, the financial viability of redevelopment. So we've been working um, with local developers to, um, to understand how multi-storey development could actually financially viably work in Richmond. And of course, um, traffic congestions, and we have limited um, sort of ability to work with some of the issues there, such as some land that's um, with Waka Kotahi that we can't influence. So working around those constraints. And, but of course there's plenty of opportunities as well. Um, council owned land, including um, some poor land use at the moment and rethinking some of that, including car parks. Um, there's a lot of public support for intensification because at this point we also went on to Shape Tasman and sought some feedback from the public about what um, the future of Richmond might look like. Um, and I mentioned we've been working with um, developers and sort of getting the understanding of the opportunities they see and working sort of hand in hand to make sure um, we're both seeking the same vision for Richmond. Um, the idea that we might be able to reconfigure stormwater, look at daylighting of streams and bring those sort of underground um, services more to the to the top, um, looking at car parking requirements, which are now gone from the plan. So there's a bit more um, variety in what we can do with land use. Um, and of course, there's plenty of existing green space and the, the areas around Richmond that contribute to its um, current identity. Uh, so I'll now move on to talking, as Jeremy mentioned this, we've sort of done this in two parts. So the town centre was identified early on as um, a really key component, especially to the objectives of centres and community heart, because no matter what way we go with Richmond, um, the town centre sort of remains that one constant of the key um, heart to Richmond, and it will need a sort of vibrant revitalisation as part of this project. Um, so therefore we put together um, a distinct town centre strategy which resulted in these key moves and I'll just go over them at sort of um, quite a brief high level outline. So in the town centre emphasis we have the grow green connections as one of the key moves. So we'll just, it's about identifying what green spaces we currently have such as Sundial Square and Washbourne Gardens and connecting those spaces through more green um, walkable streets. The idea being that the town centre becomes um, a more pleasant and high amenity space to move through and contribute to ecological improvements. Um, the second one is identify strategic sites. So that's identifying those council owned sites because those are the key opportunities um, to rethink how council land is being used and perhaps um, use it to set an example within the town centre about what a high quality um, investment and development could look like to bring benefit to the public. Uh, number three is celebrate and sustain the blue network. So as I mentioned from those sort of opportunities, um, looking at the underground uh, stream network and current flooding and stormwater issues and seeing how we might be able to bring some of those blue areas to the surface and create more green space, or if that's not physically possible, um, just creating a stronger connection to understanding the um, blue network that does exist under the town centre while providing stormwater resilience. Um, number four is encourage and enable developer response. So as I mentioned, working with developers um, who are interested also in uh, shaping future of Richmond to make it a more vibrant town centre and just um, go on a continued joint effort with them to provide better active streets and um, just connections and integration with public space. 
Number five is improve land use and street networks. Um, so that looks at the idea of just sort of targeting um, areas in the town centre that might not be have the best land use at the moment and perhaps explore the creation of hubs of different types of activity and then ensure that the street design um, is responds to that development. Um, and lastly is integrate the town centre into the urban fabric. Um, so that's more just the natural response which will happen as the town centre um, becomes more active and intensifies and then those surrounding neighbourhoods um, have sort of townhouses and low rise apartments in the residential area which will help improve that currently stark land use change just to create a more sort of cohesive town centre and um, surrounding neighbourhood that leads into it. So Jeremy will just quickly show some examples of what Central Richmond um, could look like. Thanks, Miriam. So yeah, just a few photos here, just to um, from other places. Clearly not uh, not Richmond, not even Nelson, uh, of what some of the what this could look like on the ground. Um, supporting families and uh, to to be able to come in and spend time. Uh, in Richmond is a really important aspect of that. It really builds that sort of vibrancy. This is a photo, obviously, from for those that know it, uh, from the Margaret Mahi Playground in Christchurch, which I think has been a, a terrific success. Um, and, uh, and and it's in in a in an inner city location, so um, uh, it's clearly got some great outcomes there. And this is, I guess, to show how some of these laneways, you know, that some of the density that can be created um, through shops and integrating those in with some of these public spaces, still retaining the trees, places to sit, and um, and just, you know, great places to be. Um, some of the other aspects, some of the other outcomes, or pictures that might show some of these outcomes, trying to develop a bit of a nightlife. There's not really that much to do or reason to be in Richmond uh, at the moment um, after dark. That would be part of what we want to try and achieve, try and give people, firstly, have people who, are, who live nearby, so it's really easy just to walk into town. Uh, and and then give them secondly give them a place to go. It takes both sides of the coin, so uh, that that's part of the the objective here too. Our green and blue infrastructure. This uh, sort of uh, in this case it looks like a, a rain garden. It provides both greening. It uh, slows down the, the passage of stormwater, and it provides a really great kind of visual character in a town centre as well. And then finally, just a, a general picture that can show how some of the street art um, can create. Um, you know, more interesting place to be, sense of identity, sense of vibrancy. Uh, so, you know, these are just some images that, that get people thinking about uh, the, well, the type of thing we're aiming for. And now we'll just move on to that wider Richmond. So Miriam, as Miriam mentioned, uh, there was a focus on the town centre specifically, um, but of course we're doing the whole of Richmond as well. So um, We'll just move on. I'll let Miriam talk to this, but uh, when we when we think about the whole of Richmond, it goes right out to those boundaries and all those neighbourhoods that I mentioned. Some areas we don't have complete control over, um, such as the State Highway 6 that runs through the town that's um, administered by Waka Katahi, the New Zealand Transport Agency, and so council doesn't have control control over that. We, we recognise there's um, difficulties, with, to say the least, and some, sometimes with uh, congestion, uh, but, but that's a challenge that um, we don't have complete control over. Um, but many other areas we do have some control over through um, uh, as council. So uh, Miriam, we will just let you to give us a bit more context about the wider Richmond. Sure. So as we sort of advanced from doing the opportunities and constraints mapping, we started mapping out what it might look like to respond um, to those issues in a planning context. So we made uh, three scenarios to um, test the issues and how to respond to them, um, which I'll outline very briefly soon. Just so you know, the purpose of the scenarios wasn't necessarily to, um, not necessarily that the, those scenarios would work on their own, but just to highlight some key response ideas and then sort of share those with the stakeholders we've been working with and get their input as to what they think are the good approaches. And then after that we made those three scenarios, we took the best bits from each one and went forward with the plan. But I'll quickly show you the work that we've done to get to that point. So the first scenario we came up with um, was Hills to Inlet. So the theme around this one was that um, we sort of build a really strong visual movement um, and pattern between the hills uh, down to the Wyomere Inlet and focusing on open spaces. So the idea was that intensification would happen along those really key amenity spines, um, sort of near those key uh, green walkways and open spaces and also ensuring that this plan enhanced those spaces um, for the community. The second 
scenario was a transport corridor focus. So this one was more framing growth around transport corridors, focusing on the movement of people and vehicles. And it looks at existing and potential tr key transport corridors and goes for a more linear growth pattern. So growing along these corridors that enhances um, the connection between, between key destination points and gets more people living um, more closer to where they need to be with easier access. And the final scenario we looked at was a centres focus one, which had a theme of targeting growth around commercial centres, um, with a focus, of course, on the main centre around Queen Street, and then building other local, building upon the other local centres, um, and building a smaller sort of intensification around those areas, uh, with the idea that uh, more people can walk to meet their day-to-day -day needs, but at sort of a, a hierarchical scale with the main centre and then the smaller ones uh, servicing around that. So from these three scenarios, we came to this um, wider growth plan, which we've been calling the hybrid plan, because it recognizes that it takes um, certain elements from each of the plan. So all scenarios you might have seen explored sort of the non-negotiable issues, such as stormwater and sea level rise. Um, so that's sort of those big blue lines that you can see um, around the inlet and also weaving throughout Richmond. Um, and this draft plan sort of seeks to combine the ideas of where growth should be focused. So as we've mentioned, the town centre is really key. So around that town centre, you've got um, a slightly more um, a higher end of the medium density housing. And then that is supplemented by um, a lower sort of range of medium density housing. That's your two to three storey um, townhouses to support that higher growth focus in the middle um, and still focusing around those smaller centres as well. Um, and you'll see some other centres included there and that's sort of exploring the idea of um, for that centre's objectives where those uh, centres might be missing, where there might be a gap and an opportunity to sort of align some activation um, near open spaces as well. Um, it also addresses the theme of identity, um, looking at those stream corridors, enhancing them and the connection between hills um, to the inlet, while also um, creating sort of neighbourhoods throughout Richmond. Um, the movement objective, as you can see through the pink one, sorry that there's no key on this, this is all online so you can look at it in more detail, um, but the pink identifies sort of the key uh, movement through Richmond um, with public transport and the green dotted lines look sort of enhanced um, pedestrian and walking, pedestrian and cycling routes um, as well. The green and blue is addressed through enhancing the streams and the public spaces. And of course, um, as I mentioned, those hazards, climate change has been considered through all the scenarios and looking at the impacts of sea level rise and what that might mean for where we can build in the future and avoiding areas that are at risk. So um, that's a very brief outline. As I mentioned, all will be online to look at this in a closer detail, um, but I'll hand over to Steph who will talk um, us through what the spectrum of growth looks like when we talk about these different densities. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, we just wanted to touch for a moment on what we refer to as the spectrum of growth and look at the differences as areas change and grow from rural areas through towns and villages up into big urban cities and the way that change occurs. So the diagram on the screen there shows this change from the large rural open areas with scattered houses on the left. So that's things like the Waimea Plains that are rural based and then moves through clusters of development in, in villages like Wakefield and into suburban areas like a lot of Richmond is at the moment. As growth changes over time, you move into taller buildings that make more efficient use of land, two-storey built houses, and up into things like three-storey townhouses and terraced apartments. And then over time, what you move into in most towns is um, starting to get into mixed-use buildings, with shops on the ground floor, maybe offices or residential apartments above. And this is well suited to areas around town centres, so such as the, the centre of Richmond as we have it today. It also shows a move to more shared spaces rather than large individual sections. And then on the right side of the spectrum, you've got areas like the centre of Nelson and then through into the larger cities such as Wellington and Christchurch with your high rise buildings certainly not something that we'll be looking at for Richmond in the short term. 
And it's also really important to remember that this kind of growth doesn't happen fast, but we really think that Richmond's on the cusp of re being ready for some more of the denser development styles. The provide people with more options and different living choices. Jeremy, can you now talk us through some of what change in Richmond might look like? Sure, thank you. So the next uh, step from doing that is to start thinking about what actually might uh, this look like in reality. So uh, there's a, some modelling techniques which we've undertaken, uh, which take some existing real scenarios and look at how uh, these could be redeveloped and what sort of um, outcomes we might achieve. Achieve. So this is just some snips. Again, as Miriam says, all this information is online uh, and a lot more detail about how uh, these models are developed. Uh, on the left, bottom left side here, uh, there's a, a model. Now this is, uh, I haven't put this, this, the, the numbers here, but I can read them out. So this is a um, an actual area of land of uh, 1,839 square metres. So basically two of our existing slightly larger residential lots. Um, each one would be less than a quarter acre size. If they were to be, if two of those were to be put together, um, this it would, a development like this could be undertaken. Now this has got a, a ground floor um, of um, commercial, so potential for some um, commercial um, businesses there, and then it achieves sixteen uh, residential units, and that could be a mix of. Um, quite quite small uh, studio apart studio apartments through to terraced housing out the back here, so sixteen residential units plus ground floor uh, um, uh, uh, businesses uh, on an area of two existing residential lots. Uh, it would it also accommodates um, some green space here, so with good design, the green space gr shared green space can still be provided, and that can. Um, uh, reduce the impact on the existing uh, residential houses that are shown in the black and white here. So it is a site where we've got existing houses around, but through good design, the impact on those residential houses can be uh, uh, reduced and minimised. Uh, up on the top right here, this is uh, clearly a, a much bigger development. Now this is utilising a site size of just over 4,000 square metres, uh, just, just under 4,200 square metres. Uh, so that could be, let's say, five of our existing uh, sections, and that would enable, uh, according to this hypothetical design, uh, 44 residential units. Uh, it also provides 23 car parks, uh, so that would be uh, more uh, roughly or uh, run one car park per residence, and uh, and, and those 44 uh, residential units would again be a mix of different typologies with some smaller one bedroom units uh, through to some larger ones. Some have got uh, their own uh, terraced green space here, and others would have access to all of this sort of shared green space surrounding. Um, again, a, a larger lot like this enables a lot of the, the impact to be internalised within the site so that uh, the surrounding, that the impact with this greenery, the, the impact on surrounding houses can be um, can be reduced. Um, so what might this look like uh, in, in pictures? Here's just some other developments from around New Zealand uh, where you've got similar developments. This is a uh, uh, a, a mixed-use development. It shows some um, commercial activities on the ground floor, plus two stories of um, of residential activities. Here's some two-story units which show uh, access again out to the green space. Here, some shared green space, um, but a lower density than on the left, but still um, greater density than what we currently see. And here's a couple more examples. These are both from Wellington with some mixed use with uh, a four-story building overall, uh, three stories of residential and ground floor uh, commercial activities. And over here, these are um, an, it's an apartment building uh, complex in Wellington, um, which are walk-up apartments. So those are just some examples of the, the at the higher density end of what from what Miriam was uh, sorry Stephanie was showing before. So there's a um, how do we give effect to this? And I mentioned that before in an earlier slide that we how, how do we actually achieve this on the ground? Well, one of the first things we'd need to do is do a plan change, which would introduce new rules. We Our current Tasman Resource Management Plan does limit uh, the heights of buildings and uh, it makes it difficult in many ways to provide for this these sorts of um, buildings that we're talking about here. So we'd need to do a plan change that would bring in a whole range of uh, aspects that would actually implement it. 
the need to, we're, we're looking at some upgrades to some of the key public spaces. One of the most obvious locations is to provide heart to the centre of Richmond. Sundial Square has got some real opportunities to be taken that next step and provide some more facilities that will really attract uh, families or or whatever it might be there. So uh, we, we need to start looking at that. Uh, planting upgrades. There's uh, greening of streets and spaces is a really important aspect of this plan. So we're, we're looking at developing some plans as to where that might be appropriate. Uh, parks and open space strategy uh, sort of ties in there as well. Where do we want the, the how can we continue to develop the parks? Because it's important when you intensify where people live, that you also balance that with providing the open space and the green areas where people can go. Uh, daylighting streams and connected spaces. Now that's uh, a big area of work. It involves a lot of engineering detail, but wherever possible, we'll look at where streams can be uh, taken out of pipes and put back up to the surface. And that, that enables uh, corridors where spaces can be connected. Uh, council has been uh, has identified publicly that it is going to need a new council building. A location hasn't been identified, uh, but that is something that is being worked on and the location of that new council building actually is quite an important factor uh, as a major employer and um, for the potential to free up existing built land or maybe a, a new uh, centre uh, in a certain location of Richmond. Public transport options, the e-bus is, uh, uh, is rolled out and it's going really well, And uh, but, but that we need to be building around those public transportation options so that people have got that, uh, that, that transit. And design guides, uh, we, uh, quality is an important part of this. It's not just about squashing the existing stuff into a smaller space, it's about quality too. Building medium density requires that more thought is put into how these developments work and, and to make sure that the, the amenity of existing residents is is, um, is upheld. So we need to do some work on the actual quality of this type of building and what is enabled by the new rules. Uh, and finally, uh, we need to, I mentioned, showed those block models before, how do we actually bring blocks of land together? How do we uh, aggregate land or um, assemble land so that it can be developed in a really cohesive way um, so that those effects can be internalised, not externalised onto existing residents? Uh, and we're going to be looking at ways that we might be able to uh, achieve that. Um, so that really is our quick summary of the Richmond on the Rise project. Uh, I just want to say a big thank you for attending. Uh, please put some, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A function. Uh, and just to restate, as I said at the start and Miriam mentioned, all of this information is on our Shape Tasman webpage, plus plenty more. Uh, so there's links to all of the, the key documents which go into much more detail. So I really encourage you to uh, go along to our Shape Tasman website and look for the Richmond on the Rise link. And uh, if you have any questions, then um, please put them in the Q&A. And, um, and we're all here. And I'll hand back to Andrew in a second. Um, and he'll be able to um, divvy up any questions and get a bit of a, a conversation started. So uh, I guess on behalf of the team, thank you very much for, for attending this webinar. Thank you very much for that, Jeremy. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that we have the Shape Tasman website page, which has all of the detailed information for Richmond on the Rise on it. But there's also some opportunities for you to get more information about this in person. So we have um, two open days that we're running at 243 Queen Street. That's a vacant shop that's directly across from Sundial Square in Richmond. And we'll be there from midday to 7 p.m. on Tuesday the 19th. And we'll also be there from 9 a.m. till midday on Wednesday the 20th. And um, we're going to be bribing people to give us feedback there. So if you come along and have a chat with us, get some more information and give us some feedback, we'll give you a voucher to get a free coffee. So um, yeah, that's happening. Um, there's gonna be another webinar as well. So if you wanted to, if you came in partway through this and you wanted to um, listen to it again, we're doing another one at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, on, sorry, Monday the 18th. So you can join that. Um, and yes, if you've got any questions, add them to the Q&A um, section on Zoom. And we've got some that have come in already. Um, so the first one, the question is, um, I think it's awesome to have increased intensity and mixed use buildings. My understanding is that Richmond's CBD is owned by just a few stakeholders. Have they and the developers been involved with this planning? I think that's probably one for you, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point, actually, and I think that's a fair comment generally. Uh, there is, uh, I, I think we'd say that, yes, there are some very large uh, 
landowners who own um, some big bulk of land. And then there's some very fine grained landowners. So down along the Queen Street, it's it's quite fine grained. Uh, but yes, we certainly have been engaged with those large landowners. Um, Tin Line is a company which owns the Richmond Mall, and that's uh, that's a big company. And we've um, met with Tin Line on a couple of occasions. Uh, Gibbons is a large company that owns um, the the warehouse and um, Columbus Coffee up the, at the at the sort of the more the top end of ca- town over the road from the council. Uh, and we've been in touch with uh, with uh, Gibbons as well. Um, and council, of course, is a, a big landowner too, uh, owning a number of the car parks. So that's been a really really important part of this project is to have some focused meetings with those. Uh, that, that sort of core group of stakeholders. And so those are both landowners and also those who can influence change, those who are involved in the development community uh, and from an economic point of view, what would need to change? What are the what are the levers we'd need to pull to actually influence change on the ground rather than it just being a, a, a theoretical document that would sit on the shelf? So yeah, that's been a big part of our project. Right, thank you for that, Jeremy. Um, another quick question here. Have you done a social impact assessment? I'm guessing that's for the whole project. Yeah, but tricky. Um, uh, jump in, uh, Stephanie or Miriam. Um, it's uh, not not directly. I, I wouldn't say, but I guess um, that's part of the what you know what we're looking at throughout. So the social impact is something that we are considering as we go throughout. What is the uh, the impact on all sorts of different people, uh, whether it's the elderly through to youth. Uh, we, we're we're um, as part of the project. We're talking to. Um, uh, some of the youth, uh, you know, school school age kids, um, right through to elderly. Everyone's got an opportunity to contribute, and um, we'll be looking for those opinions to come through in terms of how it affects people at, at different different ages and stages. Mm-hmm. Stephanie, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I, w- I was just going to say, simple answer is no, not yet. Um, so we we have, as Jeremy says, tried to touch on a whole lot of the different social elements but we haven't done a formal social impact assessment at this stage. That's certainly on the cards for when we've got a more formalised proposal or perhaps through at the plan change element. So we haven't not intended to do it. It's just because we don't have anything to focus on just yet. It's a little bit early to be going down that formalised path. Okay, thank you very much for that, Stephanie. Um, there's a, a quick quick one here that someone can answer, which is why isn't the creek from Hill Street to Hart Road highlighted as a green corridor? Comes down from Jimmy Lee Creek. Hmm. From the creek from Hill Street to Hart Road. We'd need to have a look at that. Uh, I guess in that location, it's a little bit further out of town. So it's starting to get... Um, can we come back to that one, Andrew? I might just bring up a, yep. a, an aerial yes, photo and um, and have a quick look at that so I can give an intelligent answer rather yeah, than just an cool. off-the-cuff one. Yep, there's also another question here about car parking, which is basically saying that lots of new developments that are happening, like the Waimea Funeral Home and um, next door to that, have very large non-permeable car parks that spend most of their time empty. And there's also a school and a supermarket car park there. And should we be sharing car parks and car parking space between developments. Yes, definitely. And one of the the key factors in allowing the council to push for more shared car parking and reduce those spaces, you know, large areas of wasted land is that we've now recently, just a a year or two ago, we've been, been given permission at a central government level for there to be no required minimum car parking standards for new development, which is great because in the past, every development had to provide its own car parking. Now the council has the ability to look at whether activities and developments have access to sufficient parking or don't need it in some situations. For example, around the town centre where you've got good access to your businesses and shops, and good availability of things like cycling, walking, and public transport, we could end up with developments that have no on-site car parking for residents in in one option, or much reduced car parking. So yes, definitely need to reduce those big asphalt areas. Thank you, Stephanie. I can probably Um, have a go at the map one now, because I've had a look at it. (laughs) 
Um, there's actually no, nothing's highlighted as a green corridor. So all the streams that are in there are taken from GIS. So, um, and then the ones that have a darker thing around them are the enhanced stormwater corridors that are aligned with those streams. So it's it's taken from, while well, it's not mapped, it's taken from um, in the written objectives that all these stream corridors will be sort of enhanced um, green ecological corridors. Um, but if there is something missing off the map in regards to what's actually there, do let us know. Um, and that centre to the right of it, if it's the correct one, I think there is the Oliver State Centre. So it's just the existing sort of small community hub within mm. that um, Oliver State. So we are just um, highlighting the existing centres which um, are working for some communities and making sure that most communities um, as we go forward will have some sort of walkable amenity to them. So that's what that one's identifying. And yeah, I can, I'll just also chip in there uh, with, without overdoing it. Uh, that has been relatively recently developed. And I think most of the way down there, you know, just uh, along that Hart Road area, um, council has identified a, well, has taken a an Esplanade Reserve. So there is a, a an Esplanade Reserve through that area, I think. And it's a relatively recent area to be developed. So as, as I'm sure sure you know, uh, it's it's been urbanised fairly recently. It's not really a location where intensification per se, is going to occur. So it's not so much of a focus um, in the plan because it's such a recent area. Uh, often when we're looking at intensification, we have to be looking at areas which have, um, uh, where, where the housing stock is probably more appropriate for um, replacement and revitalization. And so newly era built areas like that are not, not, so, um, not so appropriate. Thanks for that. Um... Another question that's come in is um, to do with the fact that what we're doing in Richmond on the Rise isn't about doing things, it's about putting the plans in place to make to make things happen so that other developers and, and, and landowners do things. And the question is, how do we ensure good development? Who wants to have a go at that one? Well, I could have a quick go. Um... Yeah, I think that is a really important aspect of it. It's 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 not just quantity; it's also quality. So, one of, I mentioned it earlier about uh, design guides, and I think uh, we'll be really trying to focus on creating a a method, a mechanism through the consent process. So, so we're working with the resource consent process uh, for development, um, where we can have a system where quality is looked at. So. Um, uh, that a, a developer may come forward with a development and uh if there's an if that if that development's able to be looked at from a quality point of view in terms of the quality living environment for those people who are going to live in those houses as well as people who live around those houses uh then um you know that's a that's a tick in that box you know they'll be able to move forward with that development more easily than if it's something that doesn't have any regard to that kind of quality so we're looking for some of these outcomes that we've talked about does it connect to uh to green corridors does it con or, or to green space uh, does it connect to transportation corridors, walking and cycling, public transport? Um, and does it uh, try to protect the living environment of uh, nearby landowners or existing residents around the site? So yeah, we're really going to be trying to find a way to um, to achieve that rather than just saying bigger buildings can kind of go everywhere. We're going to try and you know, really look for that quality. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, we've got a couple more questions here. The first one is how can we provide feedback um, I can answer that one. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the primary way of um, providing feedback to us would be via the survey forms that we've got on the Shape Tasman website. So Shape Tasman is the website that the council uses for engagement and feedback. And there's a whole section on the Shape Tasman website about Richmond on the rise. So you can go there to read the information and also um, fill in some survey forms. And we've got two two areas we're asking about. So that's central Richmond and all of Richmond. And for each of those, you've got two choices. You can do a very short survey that just hits the key questions that we want answers on, or you can do a more detailed survey where you can answer some questions and provide us with extra feedback. Um, for those of you who don't want to do this online, we have paper survey forms and they will be, be available in a number of different places. So we've got a little display set up in the Richmond Library and you'll be able to read the information and fill in a survey form there. And we're also setting up a small display in the foyer of the council building. And that'll be the same, some information, some survey forms, 
or you could come to the open days that we're running and that's Tuesday the 19th and Wednesday the 20th in an empty shop directly across Queen Street from Sundial Square. And then um, the second part of that question is, have we worked with accessibility groups to ensure designs meet their needs? I think that's probably one for you, Jeremy, maybe. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, we haven't directly, um, but the, the, as um, Stephanie mentioned before, it's a little early for getting into the, the detail aspects of that. You know, this is a, a higher level um, a plan to that, that will be taken forward into those more detailed stages, uh, you know, when the time's right. So um, certainly that, that accessibility is an important aspect of the individual projects themselves. So that's something that we can build into this plan and that, that then becomes an outcome for uh, developers or landowners, whoever might be actually, you know, doing work under this plan. So as long as we identify it as an outcome, as part of this plan, that's something that will be picked up later um, for consideration through the consent process. Yeah, and, and just picking up on that as well, I see there's another question around accessibility in terms of things like the design guides. There's a whole heap of work that will be needed to go into the design guides to make sure that they're appropriate to the different types of development in the different parts of Richmond. And things like accessibility are a standard part of those kind of processes. So when we get through into these next phases around the detail of what goes where, that will definitely be picked up in those options. I'll add. Right. <laughs> I was just the with the objectives that we've got those overarching headlines within them. We've got sort of more detailed objectives which you can see online. And I know within the housing one, it's about providing for sort of different ages and abilities. And also with movement, it's about sort of access. It's not just movement; it's accessibility as well, and providing for all those different needs. So we've sort of already got that overarching. Um, sort of mandate in there through those objectives and you'll see those carried out as the others have said through those more detailed processes. And there's one more question here which is about um, whether there'll be affordable housing options provided as part of this. Another one of the key stakeholders that we've been talking to is Kainga Ora and also there've been engagement processes with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. So understanding affordability and different housing options is another key part of this. We've talked quite a bit today about having a range of options, not just three and four bedroom houses, but different houses that meet the needs of people at different life stages, whether it's young people, young families, growing families, singles, older people. And so providing choice is part of providing affordability so that a single person doesn't need to find the money for a large house, but has the options of smaller houses in terms of what I guess you would call more the social housing end of the spectrum that is and will continue to be part of the overall community makeup. And there will definitely have to be options. The council, as it currently stands, it doesn't have a mandate to be a social housing provider, but whether those kind of factors might change over time is something to, to see. And I can just add that uh, we've got several, uh, as well as Kaing Auto, we've got several other community housing providers, um, or CHIPS as they're known, uh, operating in Richmond, and there's more coming, actually. Uh, we've... Um, yeah, there's additional community housing providers who are expressing interest and in recognising the challenges that we've got in Nelson and Tasman uh, for, for housing. Um, and so uh, they're being increasingly active in this space. So I think that's a really good outcome. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, one more question that we've got that's come in. Um, you've already talked, Jeremy, about the state highway, and we know that a lot of people um, talk to council about the congestion and the traffic issues on the state highway so that's coming in and out of Richmond but what will um, Richmond on the Rise do in terms of traffic congestion in Richmond itself separate from the highway? Yeah yeah no that, that that's good and, and yeah that's uh, just to reiterate yes we we have heard that there is um, well we know there's congestion challenges down on the state highway um, there's also uh, We've always had uh, a certain amount of congestion in and around Richmond at times too. Um, the focus here, I guess, is on trying to provide 
homes and businesses and places where people want to be all within a more compact area so take for instance the, the richmond town center if we can have more people living in the town center working in the town center and spending time in the town center then there's, the, there's then less need to to use that transport um, clearly if you if you work in richmond um, you, you may need sometimes to drive in richmond to, sorry from richmond to nelson there's the bus option so it's about providing options where it's needed but if people are able to, if we can uh, support the housing and the vi vibrancy in um, in our core location, then it gives people options uh, to have to use the car less and um, so won't exacerbate that congestion that we see. Where you do need to travel, as I say, it's providing options. It's having the ability to walk and cycle where you need to get to really easily um, or take the bus to where you need to really easily. Thank you, Jeremy. We've got one more question coming that we'll try and answer quickly. Um, this is an interesting one because it also reflects a lot of the comments that we're seeing on the posts on Facebook about Richmond on the Rise, and it really boils down to what the council can do versus what other agencies do. And the question is, have you considered how you will provide sufficient education, retirement villages and health facilities to meet population growth? Mm. Yes, we have considered those issues. The simple answer again is that's not within the things that council can do. Council can provide and enable those things to be developed by the private sector and the various different agencies. So things like schooling is the Ministry of Education. That's not a council function. What council can do is try to ensure that the growth of families uh, is is close to existing schools or that there is provision if necessary for in increasing size of schools council can provide commercial areas for things like health facilities to be developed um the zoning of land to enable retirement villages to be designed and and built by private entities but the council is largely unable to make those things happen they come from the market however uh so that, that absolutely Steph. <laughs> um but in the case of ministry of education uh, we do meet frequently with the ministry so in fact just very recently i think it was a couple of weeks ago we had a meeting with the ministry and uh we um made it very clear what our growth we gave them data about our growth rates. We made sure that it matched up with their data and we talked about our growth plans. Where are we looking at growing? We discussed this Richmond on the Rise project. And um, so that, that enables us to, to, to match up and so they can see what we're doing and then they can start to plan proactively ahead as well for where they may need to resource schools better or, um, or indeed potentially uh, build a new school such as is happening over at, in the Berryfield area. Thank you for that, Jeremy. Um, if anyone else has got any other questions that they want to ask, they can add those in the Q&A on Zoom. Um, otherwise, I think we're just, are we just about done, Jeremy? Um, yeah, oh, there's one, um, there's one question that's just come in about, um, about the 15 minute cities. Uh, yeah, look, I don't think that's, uh, that, We've 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 all heard some of the talk around the fifteen minute cities, um, and you know really this is this is not about um, it's not about control. It's about uh, providing future proof ways of doing things. It's providing for how how we need to develop into the future. Um, Richmond is moving from a um, what's historically been a, a smaller rural service town or a very um, quite a remote satellite town from Nelson um, but like it or not it's developing into a a town a substantial town even you know, maybe one day a small city in its own right so we've got an opportunity to uh, guide and that's what council's job is is to guide that in um, in a certain direction it can either uh, find its own way and you might get some really poor outcomes uh, or we can try and all work together to actually try and guide it to um, to a town that is has got some of these great outcomes that we want to see. Um, intensification does provide for a lot of these um, outcomes that we all want to see, which is some vibrancy, um, a place that we want to spend time, and it provides for some of these experiential services 
uh, that that we enjoy in our town centres. Um, of course, we it, it also helps to protect our productive land, as we mentioned before. Um, if we're able to can um, grow and enable, enable more people to enjoy the town that we've got here, as well as the access to all the other areas that that Richmond is exposed to. So yeah, so it's it's really about um, you know working with the community and 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 trying to move forward in a in a planned way as opposed to an an unplanned way. Right. Thank you very much for that, Jeremy. <clears throat> I think we'll leave it there for the questions now. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that all the background information for this project is on the Shape Tasman website, as are all the details for the open day and other places where you can give feedback. Um, so, yes, thank you very much to our panellists, Stephanie, Miriam and Jeremy. And um, thank you to all the attendees as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye.